Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the intersection of cannabis, the capital markets, and culture. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg of KCSA Strategic Communications speak with the business leaders, financial experts, cultural icons, legislators, and generally interesting people moving the cannabis industry forward. This week, Lewis and Ann are speaking with Shanita Penny, founder and CEO of marijuana industry consultancy Budding Solutions and president of the board of directors of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. Lewis and Ann first met Shanita in person at last year's MJ BizCon in Las Vegas, where we had our big live roundtable of all the cannabis podcast rock stars within the MJ Today Media family. They knew once they met her that they wanted her here on the podcast. Don't sit back, lean forward. Now on to our interview with Shanita Penny. Hi, Lewis. Hi, Anne. How are you? Good. We haven't done this in a while. I know. It's, it's, uh, it has been a while. I, I was going to try and come up with something there. I got, I got nothing. I um, got nothing. Yeah. It's busy. So, and I know that, um, what did, what was the Seth, uh, quote on podcast time? It's, Oh, there is uh, podcast time, podcast land knows no time. Right. So, um, and I feel like we don't usually, we're recording the intro after we did the interview. So usually we're like jumping around in time. Um, but I think we can talk about the interview we just did with Shanita Penny, which was really awesome. It was really awesome. It is really weird, I'm sure, for the audience to be hearing us say how awesome the interview that they're going to hear <laughs> is actually. <laughs> But we've done this before. This is the first time we're actually revealing the the inner workings. This is the sausage making of how podcasts are actually made. Sorry, Shay. She's not sorry. This is a sorry, not sorry moment for Anne. I just got to get through the vamp. Yeah, you just got to get through the vamp. So, you know, this is my third of four podcast recordings this week. And I have to tell you, I'm a little tired. I can do a, it. Yeah. I felt great. I, I think it's because I was only on one of them. So, yeah, I felt great. Fresh as a daisy. How, how fresh are daisies, by the I way? I don't know. It's the same. Are they fresh? Are we saying fresh cut daisies? Or are they still on the ground? Like, what like kind once of they're daisy? cut, they're not fresh anymore. They're about to die. That's dark. That, that took a turn. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely took a turn. <laughs> so I, I have to admit, I am really excited today because we uh, this is we are recording this on um, July 11th. We published our Mike Tyson interview, and I don't know. I know I did that one alone, and I don't know if you've gotten a chance to listen I to have it, not. but I would ask you to do so. It was for me. It, it was it really meant a lot to me. I mean, he he surprisingly had a really deep impact on me. Um, he was a much more um, soulful spiritual person than i expected and it really you know he 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 had he has an outsized presence in my 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 memory and now he has had an outsized presence in my life it's really kind of amazing so I give it a listen we'll definitely give it a listen and now on to our interview with shanita penny i think the last time we spoke and saw you was in vegas at the all-star roundup right at the Marijuana Today house. Yes. That was so fun. <laughs> that was so fun. It was we also felt, unbelievably intimidating. We d That's exactly how we felt. And we talked about this before. Like, you guys just, uh, you, uh, the knowledge in that room and the experience in that room made us feel about six inches tall. Um, so it was great to be uh, a part of Given that it, I'm only about eight inches tall, <laughs> well, it wasn't that much. <laughs> well, <of> <laughs> so it was a, it was a familiar familiar place for Lewis, but, um, no, so we, so we had been wanting to talk to you for a while. So I'm so glad that we finally, um, were able to set this up. So before we kind of jump into what you do, um, in the cannabis industry and for the minority business cannabis, minority cannabis business association, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your personal cannabis story? Sure. Um, I've had a relationship with the plant since, um, I was a freshman in high school, actually. 
Um, it's never uh, held me back from doing anything. And I'd like to think that it's actually been helpful um, to my, my overall health and wellness. Um, and it's a, it's a, you know, vice, if you will, um, that has allowed me to not experience some of the things that I've seen uh, my peers and friends uh, experience as they have, you know, chosen alcohol or some other um, some other drug uh, as as their choice of, you know, kind of, you know, relaxation tool. Uh, as I got older, though, and learned more about the plant, uh, it's something that I have uh, relied on as opposed to pharmaceuticals in dealing with um, the things that kind of come along with getting older, right? Um, and so I have, again, had a, had a personal relationship uh, with the plant much longer than I've been involved in advocacy or, or industry. And so what made you take the leap? Um, because you had a whole career and a life before getting into the industry. What what made you say, not, you know not what? Not that you don't have a life now. I don't. <laughs> yes, I certainly didn't mean that. But what made you say, I'm going to take this, this right turn um, in my career and make this my career? So, you know, going through uh, my undergraduate program, uh, which was supply chain management and working for, you know, many different companies in different industries, I realized that my skill set was perfect for this industry. Um, when you talk about taking any raw material and, and producing a good uh, that's being sold, um, you know, there were so many things that I'd done in my career that I could apply to the industry. I knew this was an industry that was developing. I saw, you know, in 2013, a real opportunity to finally do something that I love. Um, I've worked hard for a lot of companies and a, and a lot of, in a lot of industries, and I could not be um, more elated to finally align something that I'm so passionate about uh, with something that I'm really good at and, and making, you know, a more fulfilling life for myself. You're on the New Jersey Cannabis Industry Association's Board of Trustees. Are you are you a Jersey girl? <laughs> Not at all. I am I am uh, from Virginia. I went to school in North Carolina. I've lived in uh, many states um, throughout my, my life. And so when I saw what was happening in New Jersey, uh, there was just so much that I could lend to the movement and the evolving industry based on the work I was doing in uh, Maryland and then Pennsylvania. And so it was just a natural uh, progression to, to join that industry association and lend uh, my voice and expertise uh, there. And so I am certainly, um, you know, working with the industry association on advocacy and, and, and development of that industry and now looking to uh, get involved from an entrepreneurial standpoint as well. Can we stick with New Jersey for a second? Because, you know, Governor Murphy campaigned on on adult use legislation and and, you know, he kind of put his full weight behind getting it passed and it and it didn't. Um, and, you, you know, there was this really weird mix of the, the New Jersey Legislative Black Caucus and then the rural Republicans who were opposed to the bill. Do you think that New Jersey missed it by going for the perfect as a, opposed to the good enough? No, I, I think that at this point we have to we have to make every attempt to get it right. Um, the opposition that you know some of the New Jersey Legislative Black Caucus uh, presented was was backed by. Um, you know, black faith leaders. Uh, I know Sam had some, you know, a real foothold on uh, folks there. And, you know, it's just unfortunate that we weren't able to see the opportunity that legalizing uh, cannabis would bring to the community and specifically um, some of the black communities in New Jersey that were devastated by the war on drugs um, and, and what legalization could do to start to um, restore justice for those individuals and communities and then also to reinvest uh, as it relates to addressing the deficits that are are present in those communities um, from, you know, everything from um, access to, to good health care and, and, you know, nutritious food, um, job training and, and job opportunities, um, right on up to the economic uh, opportunities that 
had this been legislated correctly, um, that would be available to those communities in terms of ownership. And so uh, while we missed the mark this year, I think there are some amazing examples for us to leverage going for, uh, forward, um, especially seeing what Illinois was able to do. Uh, and I think uh, that gives us an opportunity to not only get it right in New Jersey, but in New York and, and Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. which are all right there. You know, New York also missed it. And it was a very different um, coalition of, of people. I mean, the governor in New York didn't didn't put his weight behind it. I mean, he was def definitively ambivalent. And we've talked with State Senator Liz Kruger, who has been the the premier advocate in this state on on adult use legislation. If you look at these two states, you know, New York cannot do a referendum, so it can't be given over to the to the voter. They're thinking that New Jersey will. Do you, do you see those two states getting it done next year or are we years away from, you know, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut from from going adult use? I don't see it being that far down the line. Uh, I think that we gained a lot of momentum this year. Uh, and, you know, we've got committed folks on the ground and, and, and legislators uh, who want to see this done um, sooner than later. And so uh, I'm hopeful that we will um, do it uh, through referendum or, or in the legislature um, in all those places in the coming years. That's great to hear because I think there's, I mean, we're in this in the kind of grind of it. So I feel like there's definitely times that we're like, is it ever going to happen? But so I, I think now's a good time. Well, you for got us. it in L.A. I mean, I, I live in, in, in New oh, yeah. Jersey and I'm like, oh, I'm in a ugh. whole new, a whole different world out here for sure. Um, and it is interesting and, uh, you know, uh, about the, the just the different culture and approach and how much it is kind of just seamlessly part of everybody's daily life. But we could talk about that later. Um, I, I think now's a good point to talk a little bit about your day job and your work with the Minority Cannabis Business Association. Can you tell our listeners what it is and how they can get involved? Sure thing. So I lead the Minority Cannabis Business Association or MCBA. Um, our mission is to create equal access to the cannabis industry as a way to create economic empowerment for communities that have been impacted negatively by the war on drugs. So we're doing that work through uh, policy advocacy, social programs, and outreach initiatives um, that allow business owners to network and get the resources they need. Um, it allows individual um, constituents to leverage the model policy that we are creating, the network of, of policymakers and connection to um, elected officials. And then, of course, also working on social programs that just, you know, help to educate uh, these communities about what exactly medical cannabis is and how it affects those communities, whether there's industry there or not. Um, and so that's that's kind of one hat that I wear. Um, on any given day, I am uh, pivoting between uh, building licensed cannabis businesses for my clients, um, as well as um, the businesses that I'm a, I'm a partner in. And, and one is in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, where we have a license to uh, cultivate and process medical cannabis. Um, the other is a, a non-storefront retail license where we will be producing a cannabis subscription box. Oh, Ooh. that is such a good idea. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> About that project specifically, because we are partners to uh, a social equity delivery business. And, you know, I'm always advocating for social equity and, and, and economic empowerment. And uh, just this week, you know, I was, you know, <laughs> made aware that so many people thought that our business itself was a social equity business. And so there's still a lot to be, um, explained to the industry um, and, and consumers about what these social equity businesses are, who uh, who's eligible for these programs and why they're important. So, um, you know, whether I'm on the business side of things or advocacy, they are so closely aligned. Um, and again, it just, it, it, it plays into that, you know, fulfillment. And when you're doing so much, right, to push legalization and, and get legalization right, and then you're also on the business side of it, it, it really helps you to keep things in perspective and remember why you're doing what you're doing. So um, those are kind 
kind of the the different hats that I wear and um, just excited to be able to to lend my my voice and skills uh, and, and network to both the movement and the industry. So what you're also saying is you just don't sleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, I, I, when it comes to social equity and corporate social responsibility, uh, the question I have is twofold. Um, and we touched on it a little bit. So, uh, you know, what state do you see is getting it, quote, getting it right or the most right when it comes to social equity? I mean, California is often seen as like this, you know, sometimes shining beacon of, you know, cannabis, but there is, there are huge swaths of the state that are living in a cannabis desert and people, you know, don't have access. Um, you know, so my, my question is what state is getting it right when it comes to that? And then my second question is what companies have you been impressed with, with for their CSR programs? Or is it just too early to tell at this point? So I'll, I'll talk about the, pro- the programs themselves. I, I think um, to be fair, uh, it's it's really there isn't a a model that I would want to see implemented somewhere else exact in in the exact form. Mm-hmm. Um, Los Angeles specifically uh, was the focus of a uh, case study that the MCBA uh, sponsored, and the overall assessment there was that there was still a lot of work to be done, and. I think that's the case throughout the country. I mean, and, and it, it's from a few different things. You know, this is something that we haven't done before. Uh, we're creating uh, new city and state agencies to handle this. Um, so there's kind of a learning curve there. And then the the real key is, is, is money, money for the programs themselves and then money for uh, the applicants and participants. Uh, once you, once you've awarded these licenses, right, there's still the lack of access to capital. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a real issue. And until we are uh, creating and implementing these programs with, with thought around that, um, again, I don't want to see anything that's been done to, to date um, implemented as is anywhere else. Um, on a, on a, out of 140 points um, during that case study in LA, um, the city of LA was, was awarded 85. And so, you know, we looked at everything from accessibility factors to the application process itself. What are the eligibility criteria? What are you doing about expungement? Um, and then, you know, how do we look at the uh, relationship between investors and these applicants? So there were set amongst other factors. So there were, uh, you know, a number of things that we looked at, including community reinvestment, where LA scored really, really low. Mm -hmm. Um, So those are the things that we now need to course correct for in the existing programs and see implemented better um, in new programs. If I were going to look to um, a state at this point, I'd say I am really excited to see Illinois' program implemented. They've given serious thought and financial consideration um, to some of the things that I mentioned, like community reinvestment and and capital uh, being available for these small businesses and minority and disadvantaged businesses. Um, But again, that's, you know, two, three weeks, you know, it was just announced two, three weeks ago, it was just announced. and, and, And we've got to ensure that we lend our knowledge of what's happened with these programs and other places to uh, regulators in Illinois to make sure that they are able to do exactly what it is they intend to do. Um, and of course, we got we have to make more money available for uh, the programs themselves. Uh, so responsibility, though, she I don't to, have a company. Yeah, I was going to ask. So, you know, the, the, you know, the MSOs have an outsized role in shaping this industry and right now uh, to my knowledge none of them have a you know a formalized corporate social responsibility program and a lot of them say the reason is like we we care we really care but you know it's it's the 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 problem that we're building the plane while while we are flying it Do do you buy that or are they just making excuses and not actually focusing on 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 that issue I have written some amazing corporate social responsibility plans for companies going through the application process. And so they're all gung ho when, you know, these plans will drive additional points on an application. 
And then they use that excuse that you just mentioned, you know, well, we want to get to this particular revenue point before we actually do these things. And there isn't a comeback for it, uh, in my opinion. It has to be something that you commit to. It has to be a part of your overall company um, mission and vision and then trickle down into every business unit and everything you do. Um, And so I haven't seen anything I've seen a lot of lip service and announcements of things people are going to do. And I'm eager to see some of these things implemented. Um, I also know that it's critical to have the, this partnership with industry uh, as it relates to corporate social responsibility. And without companies really uh, dedicating resources and having a commitment again from everyone at the top level, on down to, you know, those folks in the field, um, we aren't going to be successful. And so we need to be just as, as focused on, you know, um, social equity and restorative justice and, and, and diversity in the industry as we are to ensuring sustainability and, 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 and implementing, uh, these green initiatives. And so, again, I don't have anybody that I would, you know, kind of hold up as an, neither do I. But I know that the pressure is being put on these companies to do that. We are looking at mechanisms to hold companies accountable for the things that they commit to in the application and licensing process. Uh, and so I do feel that we will make some um, some headway there. Uh, and consumers are also going to put the pressure on on companies to ensure that they're doing it. Well, let's talk about consumers for a second, because if you look at the way that, that the MSOs market, they market to the soccer mom. Right. And it's the white soccer mom and they are not going into the African-American, the Latino or other you know, communities of color to educate um, on the medical value of cannabis. Isn't this a, a huge missed opportunity? Because the, the consumption rates amongst all of the different ethnicities are basically the same. Right. And when you talk about the black uh, population uh, specifically, you're talking about, you know, a trillion plus dollars in spending power. Other industries have certainly tapped into that spending power and market to that, but not in a way that is always beneficial to the to the consumer or the community. And so while I don't want to see the cannabis industry do what the wine and spirits industry has done, um, and I, I spent a significant amount of my time uh, in, in that space, Um, So I fully understood the difference in marketing malt liquor uh, as opposed to just a regular beer and doing that in, uh, say, New Mexico as opposed to uh, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so I'm very interested to see a cannabis company get this marketing to um, these other communities right and then to take it a step further and invest in those communities as opposed to just coming in and exploiting the buying power. Shanita, you just spent some time in Washington testifying. um, I think it was the House's Committee on Small Business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because this seems to be right right in line with, you know, the legislation that they're creating. And like, you know, uh, can you just talk a little bit about that so I can stop rambling? (laughs) (laughs) It was the highlight of my year. (laughs) Very few people would say that about testifying (laughs) in uh, front of Congress. A year ago when the SBA announced that they were not going to support cannabis businesses or companies that derive any revenue from a cannabis business, it took the breath out of me because I was actually looking for a way to grow my consulting business. So I've got this ancillary business. I need to grow it. And I want to leverage an existing agency whose purpose is specifically this, right? And they say no. And, and you know, there were a few organizations, advocacy organizations that reached out and wanted to, you know, wanted to figure out a way to, to work with the SBA. And then it kind of fell by the wayside because you have, again, all of these other fights in your hand, right? And then as we pushed social equity and our municipal ordinance, I realized that we have to go back and revisit this SBA thing. And so for the last several months, I've been working with uh, members of Congress and uh, Congresswoman Velasquez's office specifically on, you know, kind of, hey, this is the landscape in cannabis right now. And, you know, 
what were small cannabis businesses are now um, being consolidated or they're going out of business and we need to do something. Um, and so we've been in conversation and, and then, you know, we worked on a bill and uh, we had the hearing. The hearing was amazing. Um, I think that the, there was still that element of we shouldn't legalize, but uh, Congresswoman Velasquez was very, you know, adamant about staying on track during that hearing and focusing on how the SBA supports this industry that isn't going anywhere. And so to have the hearing and then to see the legislation introduced with descheduling was the most rewarding thing all year, because initially we weren't going to debate descheduling. We weren't even going to talk about it in the bill. Um, but through our work over the last several, several months, she fully understood why descheduling was critical to not only the business side of things, but ensuring that we can also take the steps as it relates to social justice and criminal justice reform, um, and also allowing our banks to actually support the SBA in this lending that we're asking for. Um, and so again, highlight of my year, it's always um, amazing to see um, the fight taken to the next level, which for us is public policy. There are a lot of different bills that are working their way through Congress. Which one is the one, if you could pick any of them, whether it's Cory Booker's bill, the States Act, which is the one that you, you think is the most important to get done? Or do you think they all suck? I don't think they all suck. <laughs> I, I had this, you know, grand idea because my background is not in policy or anything like that. It's business. Uh, but I just had this great idea that we could cut and paste and just take the best of every bill <laughs> and, and make something happen. And it obviously now I know it doesn't work like that. I think that we absolutely have to um, demand equitable policy. I don't have a problem with doing things uh, piece by piece, which is why I think that safe banking is something that we have to get, um, get past. Because again, safe banking, especially the way it was reintroduced this year with elements around data collection and reporting as it relates to minority um, lending, uh, I think that is critical. That is not only an improvement to the bill as it relates to the cannabis industry, that is an improvement to the way the banking, uh, that banking is done in general. The banking industry hasn't been good to black people in all of my existence. And that's only, you know, 37 years, but I, I can imagine that it went on before that. I know that it did. And so to see this thoughtfulness as it relates to uh, safe banking, I'm certainly in support of that. And I'd like to see that pass because we need it to support these other efforts, social equity programs, maintaining and growing the small businesses um, as it relates to uh, thoughtful legislation. Uh, Cory Booker's Marijuana Justice Act uh, is certainly, you know, something that I point to quite a bit. We've endorsed it uh, both times it was introduced. Uh, I don't know how far it's going to get, uh, but I know that we have a commitment from Representative Blumenauer out of, uh, and he's the, the head of the Cannabis Caucus, that there will be no comprehensive, um, you know, cannabis reform that isn't um, equitable. And so with that commitment, I know that our, our policymakers and our advocates and industry are working really hard to ensure that whatever we pass considers the people that were negatively impacted and ensures that anyone who wants to have a place in this industry will have that, an opportunity at least. Um, on this podcast, we try really hard to speak to kind of everyone in this, in this cannabis universe and in the business of cannabis to so the suits, the legacy players, the MSOs from growers to bankers to investors. But I think one thing that we lack, um, is talking about the small business and their place in this industry. And this business is so expensive to get into. And you mentioned fair banking, the States Act, uh, uh, you know, we talked about that a lot before, but is there even room at this point for mom and pop shops, given that you need like a million dollars in the bank before even thinking about applying for at a least. license? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I feel like that number just keeps going up and up and like, you know, I, I, it just feels like that small business is, is being squeezed beyond repair. Yeah. It, it's a tough, it is a tough uh, thing 
to do, especially if you are trying to create a small business. And, and there are so many people that have a relationship with this plant that want to see, you know, uh, what they're now terming craft cultivators. We want to ensure that they have a place. So it is up to us uh, to, to make that happen. I think the legislation that was introduced in Pennsylvania uh, with a focus on small business is the, the direction that we should be going in. What Massachusetts is doing in terms of, of um, maintaining um, local and small business ownership for at least you know a few years before larger companies are able to come in, those are the things that we need to do to ensure that small businesses exist. Um, Interestingly enough, what we saw in Colorado was that there was the opportunity for, for mom and pop businesses. But as the industry has evolved, um, you know, there's been consolidation or there have been folks that just couldn't, you know, sustain or grow because they do not have access uh, to capital. And so as we, you know, fix banking and we open up agencies like the SBA to the cannabis industry, we are now not only cr creating a lane for those um, smaller businesses, but actually putting resources and dedicating resources uh, to ensure that, that they're able to get in um, and grow or, or get in and, and sustain at least um, at the scale that they want to, to, to operate on. Um, I, I think that there's absolutely a place, but we have to legislate for that or we're going to end up seeing exactly what we've seen in the way of you know the msos being able to come in and get all 25 licenses in a particular state or but, well you look at but you look at a state like massachusetts so they have structured it's and new jersey even that you can't do that right you can't you can't be you know uh, a, a cresco or an acreage and get all of the licenses in the state but if you also look at the public companies, to my knowledge, there's not one public cannabis company that is led by uh, a person of color. Is it? Is there? Do you? It, do you think that there's institutional racism just at the investment bank level that they are not willing to take? Um, you know, smaller guys out. Um, what's Keith's name from uh, Purple Heart in Oakland that we talked with? Um, and do you remember who? Uh, I do. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his last name. I'm the worst. Yes. We're googling this but, real time. But there are. But mm -hmm. we have spoken with, <laughs> you know, uh, leaders of color who have talked about the 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 challenges that they've had raising capital. I mean, is it is Stevenson. it because sorry, I mean, there it is, Keith Stevenson, yeah. right? I mean, he's a great guy. He's got he's got one of the the oldest dispensaries in Oakland, which is the locus, in large part for the way this industry has grown up. He should be bankable. You know, is are, 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 why are these guys having so much trouble getting institutional backing? And you can just say racism, but, but you know, maybe you can go a little deeper than that. You hit the nail on the head when you, so uh, I mentioned it earlier when I talked about um, our institutional um, lending, right? The banking system. Um, so there is systemic uh, racism that exists. And so now when you talk about VCs and, and angel investors and all of these things, look at the percentage of those uh, leaders that are, you know, black. So if they're not making decisions, if, if they're not diverse, they're not going to invest in diverse opportunities. Um, I, I know Keith. I, I know his company. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. He should be bankable. Um, but what I see are the same things that I see in every other industry. Black women have the least access, and this is documented, have the least access to capital. But we are also the largest group of small business owners. So we, so we still find a way to make it happen. Um, and, and, and we always will, uh, but we have to do something now to be proactive and ensure that people like Keith and, and some of the other, uh, folks that I know that look like me have access to money. Uh, when you, when, I, I, <laughs> I mean, Shonda, Shonda Macias told us the story that she had a double mortgage her house to, to, to open her. I mean, that's ridiculous. So, so we are we are always willing to do those things because that's what we've had to do throughout our history in this country um, to, to make things happen. It's important for investors, especially investment groups that are focused on in uh, minorities, um, to open their minds to cannabis. Typically, what we see is is when uh, 
minorities come into this space and we can talk about Jay-Z because that's breaking news. This Well, let's talk about that. Yeah. They are finding the operator that, you know, got the proven track record. They're finding the operator that's got some, you know, some traction uh, in the industry. And so there, we are far and few between and, and typically struggling due to the lack of access to capital and being able to, to, to build uh, out some of these um, businesses and expand them. And so we're not always the, the go-to for these uh, established, wealthy, um, you know, black funds or, or you know, individual investors. I think that what I am hopeful for, though, is that someone like Jay-Z, right, the first black billionaire in, in hip-hop, um, and we certainly know hip-hop isn't the reason why he's a billionaire. It's because of his uh, business savvy and uh, ability to invest in other things, uh, whether it's it's title or, or spirits or, or clothing or any of the other things that he's done. He's a disruptor, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And when he comes into this space, this is a stepping stone for him. If you think for one minute that Jay-Z isn't going to take everything that he's able to, to glean and, and learn from the company he's working with and then build something for us, you've got it wrong. I've heard so much backlash about him getting into this industry, but it's exactly what we need. We need a billionaire that looks like us that can come in and spend the millions of dollars that it takes to get an, an, an entity started up and then uh, do it with the thoughtfulness that will employ and empower uh, people from the community. So I'm excited for us to have a, a, a black billionaire in the space and, and hopeful for what he will do and, and, and who he will inspire to join him. I think that he is going to be a beacon uh, and kind of that comfort that a lot of other um, wealthy black individuals who have been hesitant to get into cannabis, because first and foremost, if you've made it to that level, a lot of People do not want to deal with the trauma that comes from, well, wait a minute, this is federally illegal, so then I could go to jail and maybe I'll risk everything that I've taken the time to build and my credibility. So I, I think it was a, a, a great step uh, for, for Jay-Z, and I hope that he lends his voice and experience to, again, encourage and empower others to, to do the same. Can you talk about any of the challenges or obstacles that you've overcome? You know, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, black females are the least likely to be invested in, yet they are the, they are the lion's share of, small, of successful small businesses. Um, are there any specific instances that you can point to where you're just like, damn, did that just happen? Like, uh, you know. <laughs> um, my damn, did that just happen? <laughs> Moment. episode title <laughs> yeah and, and it ranges from everything i'll never forget when i was first coming into the space you know i was essentially transitioning my uh project management and and strategy uh consulting firm i was transitioning that business um to cannabis and so i led with you know my uh project management professional credentials i led with my mba and and this background in international marketing understanding fully that in, at some point cannabis would not only be, um, you know, a, an interstate business here in the U.S., but a global opportunity for me. And I remember, you know, folks that are still in cannabis today and some that have fallen by the wayside, you know, suggesting that I be a brand ambassador. Um, you wouldn't believe some of the things that people have said to me. And, and I said brand ambassador because I didn't want to say, um, oh, they want me to wear booty shorts and, yeah. uh, and, a, and a tank top. Yeah. And it, it was the most... Really? Absolutely. And so there were people that just wanted to, you know, leverage my blackness in an application on a license. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I've had a, a lot of those moments. Uh, what I, what I can say is that while I didn't have those moments in other industries, uh, my experience in other industries, especially IT, there weren't, you know, as many, uh, black women in the space, you know, I, I've, I've been in supply chain. It was a male dominated industry, especially when I was in, um, on the front lines and, and managing, you know, warehouse operations and things like that. So my, my experiences, um, throughout life and, and, academia and corporate have all, you know, prepared me for some of the things that I come up against. And for me, it's just always about, in the words of Michelle Obama, uh, going higher. And so I don't typically react personally to those things. I recognize that 
you know, while I could be personally insulted, it's just more of their ignorance. And it, it really pushes me to be better um, to, 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 and to show and prove, if you will. And so I think it's, I think it's challenging, but it shouldn't be discouraging. Um, so we ask all of our guests this question, um, and it's, it's called while you were sleeping. So if you were to wake up tomorrow and open up, um, the wall street journal, the LA times, the Washington post insert your, whatever your favorite publication is, um, what do you want to see them write about this industry? What is just a kick-ass story that you're like, Oh man, this moved the needle. They should absolutely be talking about the congressional hearing yesterday uh, that was so, um, I mean, we talked about the small business hearing. We're just, just since podcast land, I'm going to steal a line from Seth, Seth Adler, podcast land knows no time. We're recording this on July 11th. Ah, excellent. (laughs) So (laughs) thanks for the context. (laughs) No, we, we had an amazing, um, we had an amazing hearing yesterday and the hearing was on, um, you know, racism and, and, you know, and legislating for this industry. And so there hadn't been a legislative hearing on cannabis in decades, uh, in the judiciary committee. And so the subcommittee, uh, took the time to actually dial into how, why it's important that we legislate appropriately and not just, you know, legalize and, and try to come back for things, um, you know, in the future. And so this kicked off with McClintock, uh, you know, essentially saying, hey, let's not make this about race. If we if we legalize, then it'll be good for everybody. Well, we know that that's not the case. And so Nadler was, you know, right on top of it. You know, he addressed it. He spoke, you know, about the history of the, the of prohibition and the war on drugs. And so the, the hearing on marijuana laws in America and uh, racial justice was was something that we all need to be reading about. Uh, we, we have a commitment now from, again, our elected officials to get this right. We heard from the state's attorney from Baltimore City. We heard from uh, two medical professionals and an entrepreneur, uh, as well as the, the head of a, a cannabis trade uh, group. There, were, there was no witness that was opposed to cannabis. Uh, and for the most part, the members were very, very receptive to what they heard. It com- you could see that it confirmed a lot of what they, you know, learned or, or read. Uh, it also answers some questions for them. Um, and I think that it's important for people to know that the activity at the federal level is going to help course correct what some of the states have gotten wrong. So what states, you know, I know we're coming towards the end, but, you know, what state has screwed it up just so badly? Who, you know, name names, point fingers. Yeah, I'll definitely say Florida and Maryland. And so they have um, a, a, essentially they are course correcting as we speak. Maryland opened up 14 additional licenses this year. They adjusted the application process, um, the, the application itself. Uh, to make it more accessible. They did a huge uh, com- communication and outreach push to ensure that they were going into the communities that were kind of the last to hear about licensing, the first go-round, which was 2015. Uh, the state of Florida has has <laughs> is now facing some <laughs> litigation as it relates to their required vertically integrated operators. You mean Florida did something that was racist and opposed to people of color right so um yeah i had a huge problem with with the requirements in florida and the fact that it shut out a lot of people and so if it shut out a lot of people i know you know that the people with the least access to to capital or political uh connectivity that they would be shut out and so it's going to be important to see um, how Florida awards this next round of licenses, how they deal with uh, protecting the companies that are already there and whether this litigation uh, puts those companies into a position where they have to, you know, break um, break up those vertically integrated operations. Um, but the good news is, is that with, you know, public pressure and some lawsuits, um, those states are all, uh, are both going back to, to try to get it right. 
So is there anything else you want to talk about? Did we miss anything? No, I think this is great. <laughs> this is great. Can we have you back, please? Absolutely. Yeah, this was a really, really great conversation. And by the way, I would be happy to wear the booty shorts and the halter top. <laughs> <laughs> that would further nothing. <laughs> that would help literally no one. So thanks. <laughs> Well, Shanita, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate your time, um, especially given how busy you are. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, guys. Our thanks to Shanita Penny, founder and CEO of the consultancy Budding Solutions and president of the board of directors for the Minority Cannabis Business Association, or the MCBA. Find out more about her at minoritycannabis.org or on Twitter at mincanbizassoc. I'll spell it out at M-I-N-C-A-N-N-B-U-S-A-S-S-O-C. As always, if you want to chat with us, you can find us on Twitter at the underscore Green Rush or on Instagram at the Green Rush underscore podcast. Uh, or we love getting email from you at the Green Rush at KCSA.com. We're always looking for feedback and guest ideas. And don't forget to subscribe to the Green Rush in your favorite podcatcher. One take, Shay. One take.